Okay, we are recording now. Thank God. I'm going to yawn. Try. Wow. I think we are allowed to yawn because we just had misfortune uh, befall us. This is the Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv. Everybody is coming in in the middle of my sentence because we thought we were recording and the darn device wasn't properly configured. We are recording now. The Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv. I'm with John McWhorter, my bi-weekly conversation partner. And uh, we're the black guys at bloggingheads.tv. I teach at Brown. He teaches at Columbia. Uh, God, we covered so much territory in the, uh, you know, the aborted, uh, non-recorded part of our conversation. How can we recover? We should just uh, do it again. You know, here's, here's something. Yeah. Columbia, Columbia's, one of Columbia's recent products is our friend Coleman Hughes. Ah. And I heard today, and I'm sure you heard today, that I did. Coleman has been appointed by Forbes as, what is it, 30, 30 under 30? 30 under 30. Yeah. That's, isn't that spectacular? Because he is being, he has gotten that award based not on having had a whole career yet, because he's too young. He hasn't had time. He elegantly and influentially expresses his heterodox opinions about the black condition. And he has his own podcast and he writes for important places. And he has accomplished all of this when he's under 25. And he's being celebrated for that as if it's a normal thing. That says something about where this thing that you and I and Camille and Coleman and Thomas Chatterton Williams and others and Chloe are trying to do. Because that's just an imprimatur from what you could consider the mainstream. Something is happening that Coleman, who deserves it, would get that award. What is he, what is he doing under 30? He's black conservating, as I once heard Al Sharpton say. And I think that's a great thing. Well, who could argue with that? This is Coleman Hughes, recent graduate of Columbia uh, College, Columbia University College with a bachelor's degree in philosophy. I mean, literally just a couple of years ago. This young, brilliant jazz trombonist and hip hop record, recording artist is also a writer, extraordinary writer who's been everywhere. You see him everywhere commenting on race uh, with courage and with clarity, with calm dignity, with a kind of maturity beyond his years. Uh, and yeah, we're going to pat ourselves on the back over here a little bit about Coleman. Not that we can really take any credit, but actually, maybe we just want to take a little bit of credit of helping to foster an environment in which a young man like Coleman Hughes might be able to flourish. I mean, I obviously am not responsible for his talent, but I do think you and I, John, have opened the door here at the Glenn Show and elsewhere uh, where we can let some air into the conversation. Uh, which is uh, what what we're trying to do on a bi-weekly basis going forward. Mm -hmm. He saw people like me and you and realized that he wasn't crazy. That was the thing that he has told me. That's and I'm story. glad because that's exactly why I started doing this. I thought I can tell there's so many other black people who think like this, who feel like they're not supposed to say so. I want younger ones to see what I'm doing. And for a long time, I thought it wasn't going to happen. And then Coleman and Camille is also, depending on where you put his age in that group. And as you know, I got that from you and Shelby Steele. So yeah, we're not responsible. We're not his parents or something, but it is our, I think it was our job to show that you can say these things and not be insane, to not be a charlatan, to not be a huckster. And so, yeah, we, we have helped pass it on, but I am, so yeah, I don't want to say I'm proud of him, you know, as if we, we created him, but I am very happy for him and I'm happy that it happened. It really is a sign that there's some sanity. Out. Agreed. I, I am proud of him, actually. I know his dad, Dwayne Hughes, uh, separately. So you met him. Yeah. Uh, Dwayne was involved in some uh, kind of third way political initiative to try to let some air into the national conversation about uh, politics from the president on down. And I connected with him, went to an event uh, uh, on oh, the that, um, yeah. down there in right. Manhattan in New York City. Mm -hmm. Where David Brooks was the uh, uh, featured speaker, you know, they're trying to do a third way thing. David Brooks would be the featured speaker. I'm not all that enthusiastic about that, but I am enthusiastic about Dwayne Hughes, who's a merchant banker and uh, executive at one of the financial companies and is uh, the proud father of uh, of Coleman Hughes. Uh, but yeah. anyway, yeah. How much credit do we take? I, you know, um, we take the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. 
when the stuff blows up in your face and they start calling people racist, we're on the butt end of that. Why shouldn't we be able to take some credit for uh, some of the good stuff that's happening in uh, in this world? Like Coleman Hughes by the global financial journalism giant Forbes being picked as one of the 30 people on the planet under 30 years old who are having a big impact. That's that's all mm-hmm. right. And I think there's a contrast. There is um, every now and then I open up Twitter and I find a certain a certain professor, a certain black male professor who thinks that you and I are charlatans. He thinks that we're underinformed and that we have no business having whatever pulpit we have because we don't know what we're talking about. We don't make solid arguments. And, you know, he keeps keeps pushing it and pushing it. And I don't block people on Twitter unless they're extreme. But he's the type where I can tell that he would enjoy it if he saw that I had blocked him. His name is Isaac Bailey. I'm not going to be coy as I, as I usually am. And That's his real name or the Twitter name? That's his real name. And, and he's not vicious, but, you know, he's just quite partly dismissive. And I had an interesting experience last night, which is that I was part of this forum that Ford um, co-sponsored. And so it's me and Camille Ford. Ford the foundation? Mm, no, uh, the magazine, for, Ford Vets, oh, the Yiddish. Yeah. Oh, Ford. oh, Forward, Forward. I beg your pardon. Right. Okay. The Yiddish and, magazine. Um, so it's Camille and me, and then they, they wanted to have two other people. And I don't want this to be about Kendi again. We're just going to drive past him. But they asked Kendi and there was no response because Kendi doesn't debate, apparently. And it turned out that the only person they could get to be the other side was this Isaac Bailey. And I must admit that, you know, supposedly you and I are these charlatans and we have nothing interesting to say. But I swear to you that Isaac Bailey didn't say a single thing that we haven't all heard millions of times before over the past 50 years. And I was just thinking, what is it that he thinks is so wrong about the things I'm saying in this forum? I've said the things I always say. I was you know, I was neither better nor worse than I usually am. And I was thinking, oh, I didn't know until this started. Oh, it's this I.J. Bailey who doesn't like me on Twitter. So I was just waiting to hear, okay, what is, what is the wisdom? And to tell you the truth, Glenn, I didn't hear anything that outdid the sorts of things that you and I say. This person thinks that these warmed over platitudes and buzzwords are somehow a higher kind of thinking. And so what we miss is that we're just not using the platitudes and buzzwords. I was really thrown by that because I was really waiting to hear something different. And you know, all of this ties into what happened to Coleman. There is something to the sorts of things we're saying. Forbes understands that there's something to what we're saying. May I comment? Mm-hmm. First of all, I want to notice what you're doing. You are reporting on a real-time basis. It was last night, an encounter with a person by name of color with whom you were engaged in professional fisticuffs, professional jousting. And you are calling that person, uh, these are my words, but I'm sure getting that message, uh, um, <laughs> Somehow unfit, mediocre, unqualified, uninteresting, not very no, deep. No, 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 not uh, this. Second, not this time. second rate. Not this time. Okay. Yes. Oh, I misunderstand you then. Last that's time, the yes, about me than about you. No, oh, this is a repeat of last time. Mouthing platitudes. Okay, is it? Okay. Well, let me let, let me rephrase it. Rephrase it a little yeah. bit. No, because <laughs> I'm not dissing him in any major way. It's just that. He didn't have anything to say that many, many other people haven't said and that the logical holes in are clear. I kind of got I was it was interesting to me that he has listened to you and me because I got the feeling he hasn't taken the occasion to actually think that maybe sentences uttered by black people without those 10 or 11 buzzwords actually makes sense. No, he's not. I don't think he doesn't deserve his job. He's he's not. A no, that's not what I'm saying. But I, I'm saying he's not very deep and he's not offering anything intellectually uh, value added to uh, the interchange. Let me, let me try this. I'm saying he's doing something that just about anybody would do. It's an identity presentation and you learn the script and then you get up there and you be, be the angry black man, the angry black woman, the you know, I'm going to insist on the transgenerational injustice done to our people because of the blah, blah. And you mouth the systemic racism, uh, white supremacy, check your privileged platitudes. I mean, he hasn't said anything that he somebody hasn't said before. What's he doing there then? What was what was the point of having him there? We could have had an avatar say those things. So uh, 
Nobody says that about your presentations except uh, someone who is so implacably biased against you that there's nothing that you could say that they would ever take to be worth anything. Everybody says after your presentations, something like, I think that brother is wrong, but I must say he expressed them very well. He's got some profound insights. They say something like that. They never say, oh, John McWhorter, what did I learn from him? So See. it does sound to me like, and, and I wanted to take it further. I, there's kind of like a taboo on this. Uh, a lot of me- mediocrity out there parading around, mouthing platitudes and spouting slogans. A lot of it, playing an identity card, daring you to say you're an empty suit, daring you to say you're not a serious person. So I'm back to where I was in our last conversation about this. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of being imposed upon by mediocrity and second-rate people who happen to have brown skin. I'm tired of them daring me to call them out. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, the bodies mount. Hold on. Let me, you know, I, I could go on for a long time about this, and I won't. I promise you. Have you seen the violent uh, upsurge in violence going on in the cities around this country? I'm talking about St. Louis. I'm talking about Minneapolis. I'm not just talking about Chicago. I'm not just talking about Baltimore. Bodies are, are piling up. These professional blacks have got nothing to say about it. And moreover, they don't know anybody who got killed. They haven't put a microphone in front of a grieving mother at a funeral where there's a little coffin because it was an eight-year-old in front of a storefront Pentecostal tambourine-banging church. They haven't been there. They're supposed to be journalists, and they busy themselves with shit like the 1619 Project, and they don't present themselves at the most fundamental juncture of pathos and loss that is in the Black experience today. They have nothing to say about it. Let George Floyd get killed, and then there is a cost to live in a national movement. Let a hundred or a thousand of these kids drift off into uh, oblivion, and there's not a mumbling word, and I'm tired of it. They call themselves journalists. They call themselves people of letters. They call themselves passionate social critics. I could name the names. Give me a minute. You know, yeah, I want to. I want to be careful here because I am not. I'm not that angry at Isaac Bailey. There's a difference between Kendi, who we were talking about last week, and him, which is that with Kendi, the whole world is anointing him as the best that black people can present, and I find that to use this worn out word, I find that racist. And so I wanted to say some things that I thought needed to be said. With this Isaac Bailey, and this is, I don't want to overdo it with him. He's not being elevated in that way. And therefore I'm I'm not angry about him because of something like that. And he is instead, you're saying it's mediocre, but I don't think he or legions of other people can help growing up black in this country, especially since about 1966, and being minted in this idea that the main thing we need to think about, our main identity, especially as thinking people, is to decry white racism of various kinds. And so during this exchange that we had, he even said at one point, all of black people's problems are not due to white racism. He said it, but it was also clear. And in this, he's he's normal. He's not an extreme. What he really still wants to talk about is how white people feel about black people and the operations of racism, et cetera. That is absolutely key to his thought. And that means that listening to us must be extremely irritating. And I was just bemused in that he pops up on Twitter, you know, using my handle. He wants me to see this stuff. I guess it's called calling me out, saying these very dismissive things about you and me. And, you know, on the one hand, I could let it roll off of me, which I have. I never responded to him. I didn't block him. But then all of a sudden, there he is basically in my house last night. And I kind of thought, okay, here's one of these people. What has he got? What's he got? If I'm a charlatan, what is he going to come up with? And it just was indicative to me that it was just the same old stuff. And he's not unique in that. But did then, he get personal? May I ask? Did he? No, did he, he didn't. Did, not, he didn't. not at all. He is not that kind of person. But I just thought, this really is it. That's all people like this have. And in the meantime, Forbes anoints Coleman as something very special. That's a move in the right direction. I don't think you and I have any surprises coming. It's not that they know something we don't. And I like it when I see the wider society just acknowledging that we might have a valid view. So wait a minute, aren't you changing your position? I thought you were pessimistic and weren't sure that truth would win out in the end. 
and that uh, wokeification would be rolled back. Now you're sounding like you think, um, you think although the enemy has set us on our heels, we still have resources and we might get, uh, we, we might get, you know, regain our ter- lost territory and some. But the wokeification <laughs> being rolled back is exactly what this is. Think about, you know, the way it's been since June 2020. You know, you cannot turn on NPR without being lectured about systemic racism on every level. It's almost creative how many things they can yoke to that particular topic. And yet I do think that there's a pendulum swift, a shift back to the middle. And I think part of it is something like that kind of attention being paid to Coleman. And here, you know, not not Le Monde, you know, that's that's another place. But for something like that to happen here, and maybe it's the beginning of that kind of shift. So, yeah, I was just, it's interesting. For well, me, it's Isaac Bailey one night, and then Coleman's award the next Okay, day. here's a test, and I hate to do this to Coleman. When the MacArthur Prize falls on his head, which it ought to do, uh, I'll believe you. Okay, I, I shouldn't do this. I apologize, Coleman, I really do. Um, but but we're social scientists here, and we're talking about how the society is actually working. We're talking about distinction of uh, the old Pierre Bourdieu. You know that book, Distinction? I mean, I, I love it. Yeah, anyway, that's a sociologist. We were talking about sociology of the Pierre Bourdieu. But, yeah. but how you create distinction, how the social wheels churn so as to create the persona of a person, honor, an honorific, uh, elevated, a uh, distinctive uh, thing. And... Um, uh, we'll see. We'll we'll see. Yeah, what it's a. I have no glib answer. I mean, let's say that things keep going. <laughs> Coleman is going to watch this. So you're talking about him. Yeah, things we apologize going. in advance, genius. <laughs> yeah. Genius. Said, you know, have you heard friend, him play the trombone? Have you heard him play the trombone? I've never heard him play. So he's, <laughs> you know, excellent at it. I've heard, and he's you know, pr- he's probably a musical genius. Imagine if one of the books that he writes is part memoir, which would be interesting, and part his philosophy. And so he writes something like that. In other words, suppose he writes his version of how to be an anti-racist. And or, suppose it's or, really... Or what? his version of... of uh Ta-Nehisi Coates' book. Yeah, right. I can't even remember and the name of the book now. Between the World and Me. Yeah. And suppose it's really excellent. And the question is, would the powers that be that we're talking about be able to anoint him the way they anointed people like Coates and that was what I was saying. I'm inclined to say no, but then again, you have to admit that even if history changes slowly, history does happen. Here's Maybe. what you don't want, John. Excuse me. Excuse me. Here's what you don't want him trimming his sails in anticipation of trying to influence the jury on a matter such as this. You don't want him becoming the person who he thinks they think deserves such an honor. I don't think he'd do that, though. No, Nick, neither just, do I. But I just thought just, I should say that explicitly. He would be being himself. I would love to see that happen. That would be that would be splendid. This, I, by the way, is more about the Pulitzer Committee. It's more about the National Book Award Committee. It's more about the MacArthur Prize Fellowship Committee than it is about anybody like Coleman Hughes. The thing that we're talking about right now, because there's not any question about him. Mm-hmm. Okay, the question is about them. What do they value? What do they think worthy of being held up? They only embarrass themselves when they do some of the stuff that they've done. <laughs> they don't hurt me. They only reveal um, themselves to be, oh, an inch deep, oh, not very socially responsible, oh, faddish and jumping on bandwagons, oh, unthoughtful, unimaginative, stuck in the rut <laughs> of a stale a way of thinking. That's all they do. They, they they show themselves to be conventional. You know, as I've said, I I get them. I I, I get them. Sometimes I wish I could take five years off and, and try to be an actor because I think this is what actors do. You try. I don't think I'd be very good at it, but you try to put yourself in other people's heads. How does person X walk around in their skin? And you can say all these colorful, terrible things about them. But then you have to remember that most people are married. Who would have married somebody who was that terrible a person? You know, how does that person walk around thinking of themselves as making sense? Well, there must be people telling them that they make sense. How do you make a coherent human out of people like this? And in this case, I can't just condemn them as 
mediocrities in that moralistic way that that you do. I get angry at white people pretending that their work is better than it is when it isn't. But they themselves are just minted. What are you saying? You're saying they're a victim of their circumstances. They couldn't have done anything other. Ah, is yes. that what you're saying? Yes, I am saying that. They they couldn't help it. And sometimes I think that you may have been born just a little bit too early. You 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 were spared that sense of yourself as a victim because black people couldn't afford to to do that before about 1966. White people weren't in the mood for it and the urgencies were too real. But if you're born after that, you are minted in this idea that what's special about you as a black person is that you're owed, that you're a victim, that you're never quite whole, that you live among all these people who don't see you as a full person. It's your cloak and it, it gives you a sense of belonging to other people. It's called growing I up. Look down on I, I don't understand why growing up only happens in certain generations. It's called growing up. It's called overcoming whatever that uh, inheritance might have been of presumed victimhood and seeing clearly that life really is about making and doing and being. Uh, and and uh, no one can do that for you. And and I don't know. I mean, it's about it's a maturity. It's called spiritual, intellectual maturity. Uh, am I? No, what, 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 they, am I <laughs> what, missing, what am I missing here? What you're missing Are you also going to say the gangbangers have no choice because uh, they, it was a housing project that they grew up in? Well, and I pr- practically the, have said that. Here. The welfare <laughs> mother with three kids and uh, no husband doesn't have any choice because it was the culture that she was uh, embedded in. And uh, the, the high school dropout can't, uh, who doesn't know how to read and write has no choice because the school system failed him. Uh, the jails uh, full of people who had no choice. I mean, what could they do would be criminals. I mean, well, what does that mean, John? Glenn, let me ask you something. You could ask, don't they have any choice in, say, about 1975? But I think at this point, it's clear that the vast majority of people like that are not going to turn around and do different things than all that they've ever known. They're not They're not going to. What are you saying is wrong with them? Because I do think you grow up speaking the language that you hear. And if that language ends up being self-destructive, there comes a point when society has to intervene because very few people are capable of seeing beyond what they know. In a way, if you don't despise Thomas Jefferson for owning slaves and having kids with one of them, you can't despise our Omar. You know, Thomas Jefferson never knew a world where black people weren't seen as apes. And we'd sit back and now we say, well, he's a racist. I don't like him. That's just, frankly, I find that stupid spelled S-T-O-O-P-I-D. But no offense, Omar has never known a world where people don't break windows and where people don't have a kind of a sense that society owes him a living. How do we expect him to get past it? Why can why do we look down on him? I do believe that. And I well, just look for that down, in the comments. Maybe, I, maybe I'm a little too harshly, angrily dismissive of people. Maybe I should have more empathy. Can I bracket that one? The one about my, you know, maybe I don't know. But, but what I'm going to say is living in good faith, living in bad faith, that's the fundamental choice. I mean, of course, there are exigencies. Everybody, all of us are situated and we're, we're at at some sense, the mercy of large forces. Uh, you know, yeah, uh, there, there's not any doubt about that. But I'm talking about human beings here and I'm talking about spirit. I'm not talking religion, John. I'm talking mm-hmm. about how to be in the world. I'm talking about how to live. Uh, it's not self-evident, okay? When you come into consciousness, the path forward is unclear. What to do with those tens of thousands of days that you have is unclear. How to be is unclear. What is a meaningful life? This is a fundamental question. This is, I don't know, Socrates or somebody. I mean, you know, Jesus or somebody. This is this is very basic existential stuff, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, I hold people responsible to live in good faith. That's a high bar. A lot of people are going to fail. They have not lived worthy lives, in my view, <coughs> to the extent that they don't try <coughs> to simply succumb to the forces and to allow oneself to be moved on is to abdicate from our most essential responsibility, which is to live in good faith, to strive to reflect, to, to, to try to take responsibility, to, to um, envision, to plant, to raise your children, to work, 
John, there's no excuse for not doing these things. If you don't do it, you fucked up. That other person is thinking, I want to do all those things, but the white man won't let me. The white man stands in my way. The white man has the system stacked against me. And as far as raise my children, well, I want to raise my children, but I also have to prepare them for what they're going to face from white dismissal and and, you know, what, what is the word people use? Um, how you have to walk through the world coping. There's a verb that I'm missing because I didn't get a good sleep last night. But you have to handle yourself carefully. And I have to teach my children that. You know, there's this whole, this whole, this whole way of looking at it. They, they, they can't leave that. That's the language they grew up hearing. And so in a way, to, to bring all of this together, Thomas Jefferson, Omar, and this Isaac Bailey, it's all the same thing. I cannot... I cannot look down on any of those three people. Thomas Jefferson had no way of seeing beyond slavery. Omar has no way of seeing beyond what the looting, frankly. And I'm not even going to say this guy's name again, but that professor thinking that you and I are fools and that he's got the word with a capital W. And then you listen and you realize that it's the same word that certain people have been saying since roughly Stokely Carmichael, and it never seems to change anybody's life. I get it. I, I get it. I cannot look down on that person. I Let's wish there weren't so many of them because I think the black community would get ahead if we had fresher ideas. But he can't help it. It's not his fault. Well, you and I disagree, and I've already expressed myself. I want to talk about Thomas Jefferson a little bit, though. Maybe <laughs> he makes your case. Maybe he makes mine. I don't know. Of course, there was lively debate about the moral status of slavery, of which Jefferson was aware. And I'm not a scholar of Jefferson. But I'm pretty confident in saying that somewhere in his great corpus, there is a kind of acknowledgement or recognition of the of the deep, you know, sort of morally problematic character of this of this institution in which he was enmeshed, enmeshed in the flesh. I mean, he was, you know, he was, boy, that's some deep, uh, I don't even know if Freud rises to the occasion here. That's some deep stuff. He's got to think about this. These are his children. Um, so he was not unaware that he had no possibility to think outside of what he thought. Gosh, I don't know that. If that's not a tautology, I don't know what that means. I mean, it might be that he couldn't have thought anything other than what he thought because it's what he thought. But beyond <laughs> that, um, he couldn't have been an abolitionist. It's, think, not, a, it's not a sin that he wasn't. I think it's unlikely, but to not hold him responsible... I don't. The man of his time. I'm, I'm not sure what I, I, I see. What I, I kind of do see what you're saying about anachronism, about having a sensibility, a moral sensibility. In this case, with respect to slavery, that has been developed through the evolution of you know generations of of reflection and activism. Having that, and then projecting that onto somebody in a time so different from our own. Uh, including a time that did not have the capacity to reflect upon itself, which we have had the capacity to reflect upon that. Exactly. Time. You can't expect people then to think the way we think now. I, I think that that's got to be right. Yeah. But I'm resisting bringing that down to the level of of uh, moral agency, or maybe I'm resisting the analogy between Jefferson, the slave owner who didn't think outside of that box, and uh, the kid that joins the uh, gang who, who can't think outside of uh, what's going on 10 block radius of that housing project. And as we always say about Omar, he's never traveled outside of his neighborhood or maybe the neighborhood next door. Can I just yeah. notice that we're not talking about Omar's, we're talking about intellectuals, Jefferson being an intellectual, but in the contemporary case, in the Isaac Bailey's or whatever the gentleman's name was, mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about people who think for a living, who, who uh, you know, hold uh, editorships at uh, newspapers or yeah. magazines yeah. or who hold forth in lecture halls or write books and stuff. That is an issue. And that's why it's so confounding sometimes. And so you have, you know, this person who's, and it's not like I ever cared. I never thought about him for longer than a few seconds until there he was last night. But you see somebody on Twitter, you know, with these acrid things to say. And it, yeah, frankly, he's okay. a professor. You know, he's a professor. And yet, still, he he has a box he can't think out of. And he's not alone. He's just a type. And it, I'm going it to reiterate my condemnation of this whole way of being, which you say is inevitable and you don't want to judge people about, which is that it's way too easy 
And in fact, the temptation to lapse into it is often, I think, for many people, a way away from the challenge of actually having to do something, <laughs> you know, that's that's hard. That's hard because this is way too easy. This is a scripted act yeah. uh, and it, it doesn't really challenge uh, anybody. And it may be that people are escaping the competitive pressures of having to measure up at something tough, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and I, and, it, and uh, the, you know, racial epistemology. I don't need to know that. That being the great canon of centuries of learning that stands in front of you in the library. You're going to be a master of. I don't need to know that because I got this. I got my blackness. That's way too easy, man. You know, there is something that people like that do that I pardon less lightly although it's so very many people that in a way, maybe I'm being inconsistent because that's the language they know, which is that on social media, and I guess this is a tired conversation, but it surprises me the sorts of people who will actually add your handle and say something really mean, you know, something ad hominem, something just really unnecessarily nasty, and then go on about their day, go to the supermarket, go to church or something like that. I often (laughs) think to myself, do these people really not know better than that? But then if they're doing it in the name of crusading against racism, then I do understand it because they feel like they're doing a duty. They're hanging your name out in the public square as somebody who is a heretic, really. I imagine that's part of why a certain kind of person does this. It's the wildest thing. You know, sometimes I know the people who are doing that. And somebody will say, you know, John McWhorter is opposed to black people seeking equality. And I know that this is a mild-mannered person with a PhD who everybody likes, who's soft-spoken and has a beautiful, you know, it's just, and I'm thinking, but on Twitter, that person would do that. It's clearly coming from what I think of as people who truly think that it's their job to spray for heretics. And it's not their fault that that's what they've been minted in, but that is what they believe. They just wouldn't use that terminology. I really, now I sound like I think I'm so high and mighty. I'm low and lowly, but I cannot hate them for that. I hate people for other things. The things that make me very angry about people, that is not, that's not one. Well, can I just observe that the hunt for heretics begins with mild-mannered people who simply are conventional in their thinking and want to expose deviance. And it ends in a funeral pyre. It ends in people being Mm -hmm. burned at the stake. Mm-hmm. That that's what that's what uh, uh, the purity of uh, uh, devotion to the party line. I mean, okay, I exaggerate. I don't expect to be set aflame anytime soon, but my career could be destroyed. Mm-hmm. My reputation could be ruined. People could dig up stuff that happened in my life thirty five years ago. And wave it around like a bloody shirt because I disagree with them on affirmative action. Now, if you tell me that that's not cowardly and despicable way to behave in intellectual life, you better have a strong argument because it looks awfully cowardly. It's a long way from being an argument. You got a problem with Glenn Lowry make an argument. You know, I am who I am. I've lived the life that I've lived, about which I will have more to say in due course. I hope so. Thanks, John. (laughs) I appreciate your support, bro. It's important. But I mean, these people, you say you don't have any, uh, you know, you don't want to be mad at them. You don't want to, what can they do? What can they do? They can be vicious. They can be despicably vicious. They know not what they do. And they're repaired to character assassination. Well, you know. Uh, And and, and their anti intellectualism. They can poison the minds of youth. That is that is annoying. Yeah, that it's sad to see this sort of thing being passed on. And, you know, if anybody is listening to this or watching this and thinking that I'm actually very angry about these attacks on me and that I just don't want to admit it, you're wrong. You, you could hook me up to some EKG machine right now and my blood pressure does not go up when I think about these things. I really do think that these are people who, you know, 98% of them, of that person, I completely understand and agree with, but there's this thing inside them that happens to reasonable people. It's a kind of a cocktail that happened in the 60s to what was considered the height of black thought. And here we are, I've spent 20 years 
coming to the point that I'm genuinely not upset with people like that. I I, I get it. I get where Gosh. that person is coming from, but I just wish that that person was not so seductive to the white people looking on because they have all the power, or at least they have close to all the power. And in anointing the people who say the sorts of things that they like to hear, they're insulting us, not to mention holding us back because it strangles creativity. It strangles creative political thought to keep on celebrating people who are just good at saying racism exists, racism exists, racism exists. But then with the white people too, how mad at them can you be when Frank at the point where it's the only language they've ever known. How mad can we be at somebody sitting on the committee of the Pulitzer Board? How mad can we be at that university administrator who caves? It's all they've ever known, too. Okay, can I comment? I'm mad as Mm -hmm. hell at these people. I'm mad as hell at them. They're racist. That's a very strong word. Let us just say they fail to act in ways that affirm the dignity and the humanity of people of color. People of color, it's a ridiculous term in this context of Black people, of African-Americans. They, they fail to act in ways that foster the development and the dignity of black people. They take the easy way out. They're cowards. Uh, they are self-deluded. Um, they do tremendous damage. These institutions, the ones that you and I are ensconced in, are precious achievements of human civilization in the hands, often, of cowards and naifs. <laughs> uh, of people who are reading the newspaper and responding to students on the green who don't have their roots down deep, who won't say no. Mm-hmm. I mean, what do they stand for? These are precious institutions. When someone is not allowed to speak, the police commissioner of the city of New York, not permitted to speak at Brown University, that is a first order existential threat to the integrity of the institution. When a faculty produces two, count them, two reports that basically pat the kids who pulled this off on the head and give them awards for leadership, then I'm with, you know, Douglas Murray, uh, the British writer, uh, the loss of the courage of your own conviction to sustain the institutions that make your life possible. You're a steward of that. That's been handed to you for a season. To capitulate to these kids? No. No, I'm mad at them. You're damn right I'm mad at them. Some of these are good people. They're competent administrators. They are, they are smart. They are thoughtful. They deserve the $800,000 a year that they get paid and up. But they are frigging around with precious stuff. And they've only, you know, got a short period of time. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, you know, I object. That was the title of my piece on that letter, that silly letter that got sent around after George Floyd got killed in Minneapolis by the president of my university. I object. And somebody damn well had better object. And you're going to look up and you're not going to be able to get it back. The barbarians will have run over the gates and have taken control of the citadel. <laughs> they think they're angels. They, they think that they've got the last word. They think they've got the answer to everything. As and if being 23 years old, I'm sorry to interrupt, John. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. As if being 23 conveyed wisdom? You know, it's, um, it's interesting. I, I read a piece yesterday, and that piece was written by, you know, there's no reason not to break the fourth wall. No reason wall. whatsoever. Check very quickly who the piece was by, but it was making an argument that everybody is well aware that um, things like um, fascism, that, for example, Hitler, that Mussolini, that that was scary, that that was a terrible thing. But we're not as well educated about Maoism and the Cultural Revolution. Eric Kaufman has a wonderful piece in Foreign Affairs. And so... We tend to think that if we've got some leftist idea that explains everything, that that must be a wonderful thing. And if you say, well, look what happened in the Cultural Revolution, let's face it, most people don't have the picture of that in their head that they have of Hitler. There aren't movies made about it. If there were any, people wouldn't go to see them because China feels more remote. I'll admit, I don't know that much about the Cultural Revolution. So we don't think about where that sort of thing can 
we don't think about how nasty it can be to have this kind of orthodoxy. Everybody is made to read a little bit of Orwell, I suppose, but apparently that isn't enough. And so if you're a leftist, a hard leftist, and, and you think you've got the answer to everything, it's easy to think that shutting people up and beating people over the head and basically just trying to take all the oxygen out of the room so that you can get your way and that maybe it'll be a little messy, but it'll be better for humankind in the end. That feels right to people in a way that people who are on the hard right often are a little bit more self-conscious about. They have to at least justify themselves to an extent. But that's part of our problem. I thought Eric had a good, a good idea there. And um, so, yeah, these people, they're not demons, although I have used that word once or twice when I was a little annoyed. They think of themselves as angels. And the problem is that what they're creating, one, is not a coherent society, and two, is needlessly making people cry based on something that isn't coherent and also is extremely condescending to the descendants of African slaves. But they don't see it that way. That's why I'm not mad at them. You think of them as clawing and growling, which is what they sometimes do, especially when they're young and they're protesting. But I see this kind of person as a middle-aged person with a weary smile on their face who is carefully instructing some poor child in school that they're a member of a race and the races are an eternal opposition, et cetera. That person is somebody who makes good pumpernickel bread and who probably likes a little knob creek and sometimes plays the ukulele barefoot. <laughs> it is a good person who is caught up in a cult. You and should I be a novelist. You should be a novelist. I love this. I love these details. We know it's Knob Creek. That's a bourbon, people, and it's a good one, too. It's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> and she drinks uh, it. Just a little yeah. time. But Me and my yeah, friend, John like, Tyler. John Tyler's a Texan. Every time I go to his house, uh, shout out to John Tyler, professor of economics and education at uh, Brown University. We drink Knob Creek. But what I wanted to say was, I can't go with you. I think they're dangerous. And I wanted to call to your attention Nicole Hannah-Jones saying when confronted with the fact that someone was referring to the riots after the George Floyd killing as the 1619 riots, she said, I'd wear that as a badge of honor. Okay, now I want you to consider the cast of mind. The whole deep structure of intellectual error that fuels and feeds into that moment when she takes pride uh, having been the uh, uh, instigator of the 1619 Project at the New York Times, that the riots in the city would be called the 1619. All of that. I mean, it's we could unpack it. We don't have time. Here's what I want to say. The riots were actually injurious to the well-being of, the, of millions of people in this country. Okay? Those riots were a disaster. There's nothing good about them. Protest, protest. The riots were a disaster. OK, now, I believe I can't prove it, but I think mounting evidence suggests that the so-called Ferguson effect, this is Heather McDonald. Everybody got get mad at me because she had an idea. This is Roland Fryer, if you like. This is police depolicing voluntarily under the uh, pressures occasioned by uh, the uh, angry anti-police atmosphere created in the wake of events like George Floyd. So-called defund the cops, so-called kill the pigs, uh, so-called I hope they die mobs out in front of a hospital where police officers who've been shot in the face are being uh, cared for. OK, I believe that the rise in violent crime in this country has something to do with the anti-police attitude. It's not the only thing. I think it has something to do with it. These people are costing black lives there. I said it. The idiocy of these people. The ideological blinkeredness, which may have an account such as you would offer, John, they couldn't help themselves, is costing lives. It's dangerous to the integrity of the republic. It's unhealthy. It deserves to be denounced, not only argued with, denounced. It's dangerous. But. I think you should remember always, let's take Nicole Hannah-Jones. The reason that she says that is because she operates under an idea that the whole American experiment, because of the role that racism played from the beginning, 
has been a mistake, that it all should have gone in some other way. I'm not sure if she would specify what the other way is, but for her, the whole thing has just been poison from beginning to end. I mean, you know that her Twitter handle has her naming herself after Ida B. Wells. Yeah, She's on a mission. And so this is just it, Glenn. Suppose you could sit Nicole Hannah-Jones down and take away from her that sense of continuing in the mission of Ida B. Wells. Let's say that you're going to the, take away from her. For people's sake, the, the, the crusading anti-lynching journalist Ida B. Yeah. Wells operating at the end of the 19th and into the 20th century. Yes. Uh, who is an iconic figure in African-American history and, mm-hmm. a, a, and a, a, heroine, a heroine and a, you know, so, okay. So imagine taking that away from her. Make it so that maybe if you could somehow convince a person like that, your sense of the entire republic as having been nothing but a mistake is oversimplified. Here are some facts that show that you need to think about a wider range of things. It's more complicated than that. And let's say you convinced her. Let's say you took away that. And so she no longer has that mission that she thinks of herself as having of showing America and the world the light of the racism that runs throughout the fabric of this nation that means that the whole nation in a way needs to be burned motherfucking down. That is the way she thinks. She thinks of that as a coherent position. If you took it away from her, what would she have? And I'm not saying that she's not enough, but I mean that she has founded her whole sense of purpose in this world on that. And I'm not saying that she doesn't have enough else, but she's doing that. And she has this top class job doing it. And, you know, I've read about her giving talks and people, the audience almost laying hands upon her. Can you imagine how that would feel? And if you took it away from her, she wouldn't have anywhere to stand. You would be you would be depriving her of any sense of ego or significance. You're demonizing her, but she really thinks that she has a mission. If you took that away from her, she wouldn't feel like a person. To me, that keeps me from ever snarling. I, I was with you until the last, man, because I could say that about anything. I could say that about a devout uh, religious uh, follower of some cult. Yeah. I could say that about a, a neo-Nazi uh, involved in some uh, white supremacist uh, cell. Um, I, you know, I could say it about a, a people who like to get together and get high all the time. I mean, I, you know. <laughs> I don't understand where condemnation or the lack thereof is implied by the compulsive uh, nature of the identity into which a person will have arrived. Okay. I mean, and maybe it's yeah. way too late to do anything about that now. And no, I don't. And I, I know people who are on the same kind of crusade, the anti-racist crusade, the American shit crusade, and mm-hmm. I'm going to fight for my people and, and resistance rebellion. And, you know, and, and, you know, we're, we're slinging books. We're not slinging arrows. We're slinging books, but we're fighting a good fight and understand themselves to be enmeshed. And no, I don't think, I mean, I don't think in the 1930, you could have talked a Soviet Union loving communist out of uh, what they were doing uh, in their, in their secret uh, mm-hmm. activity. So, um, and you're saying, what you or a right talk- wing, or a right wing. It's not left or right, okay? It's it's uh, identity let me, and... Let me finesse it a little bit. You're saying that what somebody like that can't be talked out of can be analyzed as harmful and therefore doesn't pardon it. I can't right. help being moved by the fact that somebody like Nicole Hannah-Jones honestly thinks she's doing good. She's not doing this just to walk around frowning and to to stir up trouble and to hate people. She really thinks of herself as doing the same kind of service to our nation that Ida B. Wells did. She so really what? does. And my response to that is, so what? She's wrong. She might be. Oh, well, she frankly, might I, be. No, well, no in her a, case. That becomes the key because if you're convinced that she's wrong, I don't think your argument. Uh, in her case, I do think she, she is mistaken. She is. But I shudder at the thought of depriving somebody of their entire sense of purpose in life when they thought they were doing good. I have to, even though, you're saying that she creates harm in a way by indirectly encouraging rioters. Not, not just her personally. She is a, only standing in here for She's, a large right. class. For right. a large class. I'm against the ideology that informs that class, and right. and it, it, it makes my blood boil. Unlike you, and that's I think that's why we do so well together as a partnership. Uh, John, you're cool <laughs> and measured. And and I'm I'm you know I am who I am. I apologize. I you know what can I do? No, it's not it's, my, it's, my childhood, John. It's my upbringing. What do you mean? 
I mean, the reason that I fly off the handle and get angry is because uh, how did the, I'm depraved because I'm deprived. Isn't that that line from the West Side West, Story? West Side Story. <laughs> we're depraved because we're deprived. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm uh, making fun of you because you're trying to explain everybody's deviance by reference to some uh, inescapable set of uh, social forces. And I'm just saying, likewise, uh, my uh, vituperations are the result of some inescapable. Once um, when I was about nine, maybe 10, there was a girl who was um, giving me a hard time. And... Um, it kept going, and she was getting kind of mean, a little too much of the signifying. And there was a black girl, too much of the signifying, and I didn't do anything wrong. And you know, there was even an element in it of, I would say, she is maybe lower middle class, and I was upper middle class. She's darker skin. There was there was some of that. And she was giving me a hard time. She, she called me out. She wanted to fight because she assumed that I wasn't a fighter. How old? So she, we're about, about nine, ten. And so out at recess, we um, we actually got in a fight. Like, everybody's surrounding us. Let's go. And she was a little taller than me. But, you know, already, you know, boys have slightly bigger muscles or something. And I think I, think I got lucky. Very soon into it, I just swung my fists right at her head, and she went down like a tree. Oh, gosh. And, and I will never forget the look on her face. <laughs> After all this signifying and all of this... Where she wins because she's blacker, she's louder, she's cuter. Yeah. And I suck her in the head and just the look of defeat. It was just like, that's it. I did this intemperate thing and I broke her. And it was never the same between her and me. I must admit that that really struck me. I just thought, what happens when you break a person? And in a way to take, and once again, Nicole Hannah-Jones here is a symbol. We're not talking about her individually. If you broke her, she would be this girl. I'm trying so hard not to say this girl's name. Wow. But I don't want to break a person, just like I wouldn't want to be broken. And with these people, just like, you know, with Jan, don't say me, with this girl, uh, the, whole, the whole issue is, well, you can't fight. She was that type. And then yeah, it turns no, out it. that I, I can. Guess. She's right. broken. Do you want to do that to anybody? You know? Okay, uh, probably yes, and then again, that's my <laughs> defect because I know that I shouldn't. I shouldn't just want to do it. I might have to do it, but I shouldn't want to do it. And, it. and it's admirable of you. But let me assure you of something: Nicole Hannah Jones would have no problem doing it to you. That is true. That is definitely true. And she'd do it with a snarl. She would. Those people would break us yeah. in a second. He yes, tweets something so completely dismissive of your personhood. Mm-hmm. to a raving mob of retweeters in the tens, if not hundreds of thousands. They would not hesitate. Yes, okay. that is true. So uh, let me just say, I'm not going to be as forgiving as you, John. And, you know, that girl would gladly have socked me down to the ground, and I'm she sure. would have felt nothing seeing my defeated expression. And yet I must admit, I never wanted to see that face again. John, can I interrupt to ask you uh, to do something? We need to close by making sure that people don't think that we're absolutely obsessed with uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones and the people of three names, Ta-Nehisi Coates, Michael Eric Dyson. They always come up. You know, (laughs) so what do you have to say so that people can uh, leave this conversation, um, uh, you know, uh, with with something uh, more uh, of substance than simply, oh, Glenn, John are obsessed with it. They must be jealous. You know the um, the old Viewmaster? I, I do remember those, John. I'm surprised you do. I thought you were too young for that. Tail end. They were okay. still around when I was a kid. And there was the old kind, the oldie kind, and then there was the kind of snazzy gray Jetsons kind. <laughs> you know that, that that Jetsons Viewmaster was designed by a black man. It's interesting. You, you never hear about those things. A black, a black guy came up with that. I did and not know quite that. quite frankly... He came up with it using the sorts of engineering and design training that all people of any color were using at the time. It had nothing to do with Afro anything. It wasn't, he wasn't subjecting, he wasn't being subjected to different standards. It wasn't about different ways of knowing. He did what everybody else did. And if you were a kid like me in the 70s and you were looking at the Viewmaster and that thing was fun to hold and it was an interesting color, I couldn't tell you what color they made that plastic. It's a black guy who did that. So there's something positive. If I'm just pulling that out of the air, but 
that that's a thing. Sounds good to me, John. <laughs> Pew master. <laughs> Remember those? I do. I do. This was before electronics. You know, that you have this little device, you put it up, you put a card in there, and you get yeah. to see a picture, you know. And it was a circle, right. And, and yeah, you know, and you could switch from one frame to the next to the next. Yeah. Wasn't that fun? Yeah, that was fun, John. I'm old, man. That, that was that was fun. I'm I'm old though. Anyway, never mind. We're going to sign off Glenn and John, the Glenn Show. Check us out at patreon.com forward slash Glenn Show uh, every other week here at the Glenn Show. Thanks, John. Have a good one, folks. Thanks, Glenn.